there's also considerable effort uh, that is needed in the context of setting up climate resilient healthcare facilities. Uh, we would like countries to use this platform to discuss the work carried out in the space and concerns if any in accelerating these interventions. Uh, coming back to the remote training, in session one today, we'll be covering the uh, WHO climate resilience framework for washing healthcare facilities, uh, discussion for which will be guided by our colleague Elena the approach, the technical officer for climate change at HQ, and Carlos Corvalen, followed by a session on washing at CF, links uh, with health and introduction to the practical eight practical steps led by Maggie and Arabella, our colleagues from the WASH team at Geneva. Following this, we'll have a presentation on ensuring cleaner, safer health facilities led by Dr. Anjana Bhushan, who is the regional advisor for the service delivery system from the Department of Health System Development at Zero. In the last half hour, we will open the floor for countries to discuss key interventions in Washington healthcare facilities. Uh, in the interest of time, countries will be provided two minutes each to mention one major success, challenge, or issue that they may be grappling with in the context of both Washington healthcare facilities and climate resilient HCF. That's about it for session one. In session two, which we, will be led by Maggie tomorrow, We'll be covering a methodology for WashFit, a uh, risk-based management tool for strengthening quality of care through improvement of uh, WASH services in healthcare facilities. So in today's session, we have participation from countries in Seattle and Wipro. Wipro will be sharing with us their experiences and uh, uh, Washington CF as well. Uh, so to kickstart the session, may I have participants uh, please introduce themselves. Um, also, when you introduce yourself, uh, I'll request the other participants to, who are not talking to keep their uh, audio on mute. Thank you. Let's uh, start with the introductions, please. Bangladesh. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Wali Ullah, consultant WSO, and I have with me a government counterpart, Dr. Moon Moon. I am requesting her to introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Fadana Tahir Moon Moon, working as Deputy Program Manager. I am Dr. Maybe some of uh, us are not muting. Yes, it's okay now? Yes, yeah, okay now. Please continue. Uh, yeah, uh, we are working together uh, from the Ministry of Health, working with the WHO and UNICEF. And may I just uh, ask the point? The question. So uh, let us uh, introduce our other countries. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Indonesia? Do we have anyone from Indonesia? Yes. Uh, my name is Sarada Dikari. I am here from Indonesia. And uh, I am working here in the program Health and Environment in the WHO country of East, Indonesia. And also from the Ministry of Health, our two staff from the WHO, uh, Ms. Devi and Ms. Neni, they are also joining together with the uh, focal point uh, members from the Ministry of the Health, Environmental Health Division, and the Health Facility Division. There will be around 10 people. I am not sure whether they would be able to uh, introduce themselves to the system there. Therefore, I just brief from here. Thank you. Thank you, Sharad. Thank you for introducing yourself as well as everyone else. Uh, we will go ahead with Nepal now. This is Sudan from Nepal country office as a focal point, was focal point. Yeah. My colleague Rajaram also joining with us yeah, with different, uh, his name and we are so yeah, from government side also there are a couple of participants. They are supposed to join, but I cannot see them. Yeah, maybe from not Kathmandu, they are from outside of the Kathmandu. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 
Hi, this is Rajaram from Nepal. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Nepal. Uh, Timon Lesti. Do we have anyone from Timon Lesti? Do we have anyone from Sri Lanka? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Virginia, uh, uh, country of his focal point uh, for WASH, and the, our gov government counterparts will be uh, joining from the Ministry of Health. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, do we have anyone from Myanmar? Uh, Dr. Kang from Myanmar? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you nice and clear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Sanjo Kai, uh, the Banking Office in Myanmar. I'm together with one of the colleagues from Ministry of Health Network and other uh, three are uh, joining from the other area. Hello. Everybody can walk to Afghanistan. My name is Ewen. Tiguri Daida. From Anuman Education Division and under the Bamano Public Health, Myanmar. Thank you, Myanmar. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is me, Dr. Almimia, Assistant Director from Occupation and Environment Health Division, Ministry of Health and Sport, Myanmar. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. So, if we are done with the introductions from CRO, um, is there anyone else from Sierra who has not introduced themselves? Hi, Faustina, this is Anjana Bhushan. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Anjana Bhushan, Regional Advisor, Service Delivery Systems, also responsible for service quality and safety. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anjana, and welcome. Uh, we'll now move ahead to introductions from Wipro. Uh, do we have anyone from Wipro here? Alex? Hello, hello. Hello. Yes, excuse me. Good morning. Yeah, nice and clear. I am, I, am, I am Alex Hildebrandt. Right. I work as a consultant. Good morning. Uh, here it is morning time in Portugal. I am uh, working with uh, Wipro on the issue of wash and healthcare facilities. I have been working earlier in Seattle, and uh, I know some of you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have anyone else from the group? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, yes. yes, I'm Gia, technical officer from Vietnam office uh, in charge of uh, water and sanitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, good afternoon. Hello. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'm Bonnie McTeba. I'm the technical officer for environmental health at the WH country office in the Philippines. I'm also the point person for WASH. Thank you. So, uh, I'm assuming the introductions are done for both Tiro and the group. If there's anyone else, uh, please let me know. Hi, Faustina. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. Oh, yeah. This is Vicky, uh, uh speaking from uh, WHO and Minister of Health Office. So we are here uh, with us with uh, around like 10 people here. So nice to meet you. Thank you, baby. So, uh, Hi, who, is uh, who is this? Hi, Faustina. This is um, Nola, Technical Officer for Environmental Health, Papua New Guinea. Thank you and welcome. Hello, this is um, Claire Kilpatrick, and I'm a colleague of Arabella and Maggie in WHO office, working as a consultant on water sanitation, hygiene, and healthcare. Thank you. So now that we're done with the introductions, um, Hello. I think we can... Yes? Yes, please? Hello? 
I am from Watery in Bangladesh. I am Nurullah. I am the health advisor in this office. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Faustina. This is Arabella. Just to introduce myself, um, I'm Arabella Hater from um, the the Wash team in Geneva, and I noticed a few other people online as well that maybe haven't introduced themselves. I saw Timor Leste. I can see their lovely faces, but they obviously aren't able to speak. But they, I can see their videos, so they're definitely online. Um, mm -hmm. And perhaps Karina and Julie both want to introduce themselves as well. Maybe Karina first. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, I'm Karina from Moldova and uh, consultant in war and sanitation. Thanks, Karina. And Julie? So, hi, my name is Julie Storr, and I'm the. Um, I work with the WASH team. I work with Arabella at WHO. I also am an infection preventionist, and I also work with WHO um, quality as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julie and Karina, for the introduction. And thank you, Arabella. So, I think we can move ahead to the session. For the countries who are not able to join, we'll be sending out a recording uh, of the sessions for their reference. In the interest of time, I would request presenters to not exceed the time slots provided to them, and we'll limit the time for clarifications to five minutes after every presentation. Uh, request participants to keep their questions ready and to use the chat box for questions so that they may be taken up at the end of the presentation. We will now start with the presentation from Elena on the WHO Climate Resilience Framework for Washington it's here. Elena, over to you. Uh, Carlos Corbalan, my colleague, will start with the presentation and I will quickly go through the final slides. So I invite okay. my colleague Carlos to start. Carlos, you're now the presenter and hopefully have control of the slides. Um, are you able to talk? Yes. Uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. You can hear me well? Yeah, very well, Carlos. Go Perfect. ahead. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm going to be speaking uh, very quickly because we have a lot of uh, to cover, but uh, Basically, what we want to present to you is a framework for building climate resilient and environmentally sustainable healthcare facilities, which is uh, uh, it's not a new work, but uh, perhaps it's very new in the sense that uh, we're trying to do something that really fits the needs of uh, uh, all countries, developed and developing countries, and at the same time, touching both on climate resilient and environmental a sustainability in healthcare facilities, which is not an easy task, but it's very important to do. Uh, so I'm going to start very quickly to give you the background of where this comes from, and you're going to be recognizing very quickly what I'm going to be presenting here, because these are the pathways of climate change and human health. And I'm sure that many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with this uh, uh, framework, or perhaps you're familiar with something very similar, because this comes from the IPCC, the FIFA assessment report. The whole idea in this first slide, which you're going to see that this is evolving into something that becomes really important for you at the end, uh, and begins on the left on climate change risks that go through exposures in the center, and they end up in health impacts on the right. And if we go to the chapter in the IPCC that talks about health and about this diagram, they have a lot of statements uh, that they analyze different uh, 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 reports, as you know, and they come up with some statements that may have very high confidence or high confidence or medium confidence. And this one with, with high confidence says that the health of human population is sensitive to shifts in weather patterns and other aspects of climate change. So this is very high confidence. And then if we move forward a little bit, we can see a lens here that we call environmental conditions. And what, is, what this is saying is that 
depending on your environmental conditions, something will change between these hazards and the exposures. So, of course, uh, your conditions are very different if you live in a mountain region than if you live, for example, in a small island. And this is why this environmental condition lens is so important. If we move forward a little bit on the right hand side, now another lens appears, which is more like the social conditions here called public health capability and adaptation. And what it's saying is that although you may have the exposures, you may get health impacts depending on what are we doing in the middle. So whether we have, a, for example, climate resilient health systems or healthcare facilities, whether we have early warning systems, et cetera, this is gonna be changing the impact on health. Then the IPCC says that in recent decades, the climate change has contributed to levels of ill health, which is likely through the present worldwide burden, though the present worldwide burden of, the, of disease is small compared with other stressors on health and is not well quantified. And this is very important to understand because uh, when we speak of uh, the global burden of disease from environmental risk factors, and we talk about 13 million deaths per year, roughly, and then when we speak of climate change, at the moment we're not able to quantify it very well, and so we're speaking about 250,000 deaths perhaps by 2030. So it doesn't seem like very important at the moment, but we know that it is, and the big issue is the difficulty because of the complexity of the diagram that you can see is on quantifying the health impacts. So why this is relevant to the work that we're doing today? Because I don't know about you, but I personally see wash related issues everywhere. So whether it's in the, in the climate change hazards, in the environmental conditions, in the exposures, in, in what we can do in public health, and in the health impacts. So, and the IPCC says with very high confidence that the most effective measures today to reduce vulnerability are programs that implement and improve basic public health measures, and it mentions specifically the provision of clean water and sanitation. So we move now to, with that introduction, to building climate resilience and environmentally sustainable healthcare facilities. And what I'm gonna be showing you are some framework elements. Uh, this is work that we uh, developed with uh, Elena when I was in Geneva about a month ago. And uh, so not a lot of people have seen this uh, and uh, so it's rather new, be interesting to see uh, your views on this as well. So here we have uh, this large box that we can call the global environment. So everything, and inside the global environment, we have climate change. So climate change is part of the global environment and of course, we have people and we have healthcare facilities because this is uh, the interest that we have in this presentation. And then we know that both uh, healthcare facilities and people, through their activities, they contribute to climate change through the emissions of greenhouse gases. And through the, it's, uh, their activities, they also contribute to other damage of the environment in the form of waves, of air pollution, of uh, contaminated water, sanitation, chemicals, and so many others. In 2019, WHO and the World Health Assembly uh, reviewed and approved a global strategy on health, environment, and climate change. And within this strategy, there are several goals, and one goal specifically refers to health care settings, and it says, all healthcare facilities and services are environmentally sustainable. This is the goal. Using safely managed water and sanitation services and clean energy, sustainably managing their waste and procuring goods in a sustainable manner, they are resilient to extreme weather events and capable of protecting the health, safety, and security of the health workforce. So this is very inspiring and very useful for what we need to do and we can convert this uh, long sentence into this little diagram, uh, coming back to what we were talking before. So we have there the climate resilient now, and 
the environmentally sustainable healthcare facilities, and everything that happens around it related to uh, water, sanitation, waste management, uh, uh, energy and carbon, low carbon healthcare, uh, sustainable infrastructure and technology, etc. So everything uh, of interest that has been uh, mandated through the World Health Assembly is in this little box. And then we can take all this and look at what is really essential from there. And we realize that uh, the environmental requirements for safe and quality care would be health having a, a functioning, a skilled, informed, sufficient numbers, well aware healthcare workforce. It is having the right wash services, including access to water, which many healthcare facilities don't have, uh, having access to energy, and we know that uh, some healthcare facilities are large emitters of greenhouse gases, but many others in developing countries, they don't even have energy to emit any, any greenhouse gases. So there's a, a huge imbalance globally. And of course, uh, the infrastructure and the technologies that are used are also very important. So we have these four key elements uh, for, on, on which we're basing on to create the framework we're gonna be working on. So we have a definition uh, of climate resilient healthcare facilities, and it says that they are those that are capable to anticipate, respond to, cope with, recover from, and adapt to climate related shocks and stress so as to bring ongoing and sustained healthcare to the target population despite an unstable climate. So, this is the same scheme as before the diagram, but we added a lens, and that lens is called climate resilience, uh, which means to protect healthcare facilities from external shocks and stresses. And note that under climate change, we have um, extreme weather events, we have fires, uh, we have um, sea level rise, but we also have climate sensitive disease outbreaks. So this is what we, we understand by having resilience to, from the point of view of healthcare facilities. So we have climate change, we have this lens that is protecting healthcare facilities um, through resilience. Then we can think of many sample questions on resilience, and we are actually compiling a very list of these. And for example, is the infrastructure of the healthcare facility able to withstand climate-related emergencies? Is it able to provide safety for patients, staff, and visitors? Does the healthcare facility have an emergency plan, an emergency energy plan? Or does it have a protocols to secure supplies of water in the event of an emergency, et cetera? So many things that we can think of. And then we move to the other side, which is environmental sustainability in healthcare facilities, which is the healthcare facilities responsible interaction with the environment to avoid depletion or degradation of natural resources, ensuring long-term environmental quality and the strengthening of resilience to extreme weather events and climate change. And then we have the same diagram as before, but the lens now is in the other side, is an environmentally sustainable interventions lens, which means uh, two things. On the one hand, we want to optimize consumption of uh, some uh, natural resources. So water and energy, for example. Some facilities may waste water, may waste energy, and others don't have enough water and energy. That's why we'd say we need to optimize that. At the same time, we need to reduce what comes out of the healthcare facilities in the form of air pollution, greenhouse gases, and several uh, forms of healthcare waste. So we also would have lots of questions to answer about this. For example, does the healthcare facility implement energy conservation? That would be an environmental sustainability question. Um, does it have uh, procedures for proper disposal of pharmaceuticals, et cetera? 
So we end up with this first attempt at a framework in which we have climate change on the left side, healthy people and healthy environment in the other side, and we have healthcare facilities in the middle that are both resilient and environmentally sustainable. So uh, the next one is for Elena to, so over to you, Elena. Thank you, Carlos. Um, I just wanted uh, to, to link uh, the presentation that Carlos uh, kindly did and related to the previous work that we've developed in relation to climate resilient um, health systems because some of you may be a little bit um, concerned on how these two areas of work relate to each other. So basically, we realize um, that uh, under climate uh, resilient health systems, as you know, the key actor is really related to healthcare facilities because they are in front of all the impacts and they are the one in charge of um, protecting the health of the populations. So basically, as you know, to develop this overall framework for building climate resilient health systems, we base on the six building blocks of health systems, being leadership and governance, health workforce, health information system, products and technologies, service delivery and financing. So as you saw in Carlos' presentation, what we've done in, with regards to healthcare facilities is mainly in relation to the health workforce essential medical products and technologies and service delivery, mainly in relation to environmental determinants of health, wash, healthcare waste, and energy. This is not to say that other components of the overall system are not important, because if you think, for example, on surveillance, several healthcare facilities will be sentinel sites, and there are ways for you to improve, for example, surveillance function at healthcare facility level. But we thought that to respond to this specific uh, demand from countries to guide them on how to really strengthen the resilience and environmental sustainability of healthcare facilities, we should focus on these four environmental uh, requirements that all healthcare facilities um, have. Um, so this is just summarizing the framework that was kindly introduced to us. These are the, the, the four environmental requirements of all health facilities, health workforce, energy, infrastructure and technology, and goals. So around these key requirements, as Carlos explained, we will need to, to implement uh, improvements both in relation to resilience but also in relation to environmental sustainability. Not all healthcare facilities will go, for example, to environmental sustainability improvements, of course, they will have to respond to their own priorities and needs and to be context specific. Um, so basically, this is the framework for building climate resilient and environmentally sustainable healthcare facilities in relation to the overall framework for health systems. Um, something that we thought that would be important to make sure that uh, the work that we are developing is going to be really practical and user friendly is to develop a, an assessment tool. So basically, the overall framework will be accompanied by checklists for all the four requirements for both um, resilience and uh, environmental sustainability. So throughout um, these key uh, components, health workforce, wash, energy, and infrastructure and technology, you will have a menu. Uh, that will give you information on which are, for example, the minimum requirements that you will need in terms of energy access, water. But then as you um, get uh, to a stronger position, you will be able to go forward and then, for example, just implement incremental um, improvements so that at the end, you will be able to become even environmental uh, sustainable with regards, for example, to energy efficiency measures or uh, procurement of even food uh, and waste management and so on. This is just a summary. I thought it would be nice and you will not have much time to present on your own improvements. I just summarize the information included in the presentations you share with us. So, for example, you see that uh, most of the ongoing activities and priorities that you identified with, with regards to climate resilient healthcare facilities at country level 
are really related to the to the components of the overall climate resilient health system framework and to these four components that Carlos kindly also included in the overall presentation. So for sure, capacity building with regards to health workforce and enough um, workforce that are able to respond to any stress or shock that is caused by climate uh, change, yeah, like for example, an outbreak of a climate sensitive disease like dengue or cholera. Then um, most of you link the overall work on healthcare facilities to policy level at country level, which is, for example, the development of the health component of the national adaptation plan. I think this is a nice priority and it's a nice way of integrating the work that you are doing at healthcare facility level with the overall policy on climate change and health at national level. And uh, I think it's very important that you include this work in the overall map because then ideally this will be the plan that will be implemented in the medium and long term with regards to protecting the health of the population from climate variability and change. Energy first access, but also efficiency uh, measures were prioritized by most of the countries, worse access also, waste management, and also development of standards um, with regards to climate resilience for water sanitation and hygiene and also waste management. And also some of you refer to the implementation of climate resilience and water safety plans at the healthcare facility level, which is basically the wash fit. Then again, infrastructure and technology, which is the third component. Assessment of vulnerability and adaptation options. So most of you related also the assessment of healthcare facilities with the overall assessment of vulnerability at country level and included also the need to understand the specific capacity but also vulnerabilities of healthcare facilities to deal with the increased uh, health risks posed by climate variability and change, also via water and sanitation. Developing uh, the scope for implementation of improvements at healthcare facility level and guidelines, piloted it, then disaster risk reduction, which is a key component um, with regards to the overall uh, work on climate change and health at system level. Integration of climate change consideration within specific vertical programs like dengue, cholera, um, nutrition, and then research. As you see, there is like a nice uh, combination of both uh, system-wide um, improvements and specifically at uh, health care facility level. And just to finalize, the key hazards um, uh, highlighted by most of the countries were in relation to extreme weather events, flooding, landslides, fires, heat waves, cold waves, and then gloves. Um, I just uh, tried to summarize this because none of the countries were really comprehensive when relating to the potential hazards from climate change and health. So this is an area of work that we think we have to, to improve. Mainly, if you are going to also strengthen the work that you are going to do with regards to climate resilient goals, you will have to consider other um, impacts via goals. For example, hazards related to increasing water temperature that we are going to determine potential outbreaks. Then, um, as challenges, based on information on capacities and gaps, this is uh, linked to the vulnerability and attention assessment improvement that I uh, mentioned before, lack of evidence linking improvements in climate resilient healthcare facilities to disease burden due to climate change, working in silos and the difficulty of integrating climate change within vertical programs, financial and coordination issues, water supply and energy backup, lack of human resources, so this is not only related to capacity but also to enough um, workers uh, with enough capacity to deal with this uh, increased risk uh, from climate change and health. And then having a specific um, section for environmental health and health and healthcare waste management, but not really on climate change. So again, working across different sectors and, um, and uh, in a comprehensive way. With this, I will just uh, finish my presentation. Thanks to you.
Thank you, uh, Carlos and Elena, for a very informative presentation uh, on the framework elements of uh, building climate resilience and environmentally sustainable healthcare facilities and its link to uh, climate resilient health systems. Uh, I'm sure uh, the countries uh, benefited from it. Uh, I can't see any questions in the chat box, but uh, I'd like to open the floor for questions, if any. Do we have any questions for uh, Carlos and Elena? Austina, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I have um, a question for Elena and Carlos. So this is Maggie from WHO HQ. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself at the beginning. Just wondering, where do you recommend facilities to start? I mean, this was really comprehensive, and, and you know, thank you for giving us the big picture, but also some of the specific actions. But where do you think, you know, especially for smaller facilities, where is a Where's a good place to start, or where have you seen um, that countries can make quick wins um, right away on some of these uh, climate resilient and environmentally sustainable interventions? Over. Maybe I go first, and then I will request Carlos to 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 add in because I sure he has uh, good uh, recommendations. From my experiences, uh, for sure, it depends on the priorities at country level. As you said, uh, it's, uh, we are thinking about uh, healthcare facilities in Africa. Most of them even um, lack access to key uh, environmental inputs like water, uh, sanitation, energy. So they will try to focus on these basic um, and critical inputs first. If you think about the uh, uh, examples of healthcare facilities, even in Thailand, um, in some cases they are quite strong and they want to focus on reducing their environmental and climate uh, footprint. So they will want, for example, to implement um, energy efficiency measures. So I think that it will depend a lot on which is the priority at country level. Um, out of the projects that we are implementing currently uh, in some countries, they are aiming to implement also uh, improvements at healthcare facility level. Some they will focus on energy, uh, some on water, both for resilience and for um, greening and environmental sustainability. And as you saw, I mean, I don't think countries will have the resources required to improve, for example, all infrastructure, buildings, and making sure that uh, uh, they will uh, be strong enough to, to withstand a potential um, I mean, sea level rise or uh, cyclone. But uh, again, base, if we are thinking about uh, healthcare facilities in, in islands, they will want to focus first on these uh, string weather events. So I think it's quite uh, context specific. Carlos, you would like to add to that? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Thanks. Um, well, I, I fully agree with uh, what Elena said. I think that uh, uh, the main issue is for a healthcare facility uh, or a group of facilities in a similar setting to do an assessment of what are their needs and what is it that they can really do uh, without a lot of um, expensive interventions. Because this could be some very simple things like to to clean your uh, surroundings, ensure that there's no uh, healthcare waste around. I mean, we've seen some amazing, terrible uh, picture from some places. And uh, so these are things that, that you can actually do. And if you are a very wealthy uh, and large facility in a developed country, of course, uh, perhaps what you can do is so much more and even uh, become um, carbon neutral in the next few years, like uh, the uh, in the UK was planning to do. So um, I think that it, we, we, we don't have like a one formula and that what we aim to present is a menu of things that can be done and someone will look at that and say, well, this really doesn't apply to us at all because we don't, we don't have this problem. However, these other three issues related to wastes uh, yes, we can do because obviously people have been complaining already and we can address that, et cetera. So uh, the, the other question, 
Maggie, is the issue of uh, environmental sustainability versus uh, resilience. Yeah. And uh, I think that, uh, again, I mean, some places, they will really need to act uh, uh, in front of uh, building resilience very quickly. Uh, if it's a, a small island suffering from uh, uh, sea level rise, then that becomes an urgent uh, thing. But for another place, it would maybe an issue of uh, only focusing on environmental sustainability. Thank you, uh, Elena and Carlos. So we have a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, I'll read them out if we can quickly take them and so that we can move to the next session. So the okay, let Yeah, please go ahead, Elena. I will quickly respond to some of them. Do you have any standards for climate resilient healthcare facilities? And um, how can we develop climate resilient healthcare facilities and which is the current status of the guidelines? So I think I will respond to these three questions just with one answer. Carlos uh, is working uh, with several units within WHO, the disaster people, integrating the smart hospital and um, safe hospital initiative, the energy people, the wash people, um, the occupational health people, and then um, we aim to have a first draft by April, May, advanced draft, uh, which will include already this checklist. Um, and then we will organize a technical expert meeting with all of you because we consider that your experiences at country level and your knowledge will help us to finalize this uh, uh, guidance that will be then ready to be piloted by all of you. Um, Carlos, do you want to add quickly to that? Uh, no, Elena, only that uh, we're working very hard to come up with uh, this work, and I think this may respond to some other question about uh, this is still work in progress, and um, this, it will be finished this year, but we don't know when. Um, and then another question from two people also, where does infection prevention and control come in? This is from uh, colleagues in the Philippines and also Vietnam. I think this is a nice uh, challenge that you are putting in front of us. We thought that it would be a little bit tackled through uh, water sanitation, waste management, and also um, probably energy and technologies. But again, this may be required. And we will not cover all of it. Just We just want to focus really on what is going to be affected by climate change and which is required to ensure environmental sustainability. So this is not going to be a comprehensive IPC uh, assessment tool, neither. Thank you, Elena. Uh, do we have any other questions? If we don't have any more questions, I think we can go to the next session. Um, Maggie, would you like to take the floor for the next session? Sure. Thank you, Faustina. Oops, I went the wrong way. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about the global work on WASH and healthcare facilities, a little bit about um, the practical actions which are focused on nationally um, what can be done. Um, but also highlight some of the key health initiatives and programs um, that are integrating this work and for which we see as important vehicles of, of making sure that WASH and all the climate aspects of WASH are mainstreamed within the health sector. So we're going to first try to do a video, and maybe Arabella can help me. If we don't get it to work, we'll share the link in the chat box. But this is a short video about the recent World Health Assembly resolution. So um, Arabella, if you could see if you could get the video to work. I'm just trying now. Let's see if this works. I've never tried to do a video on WebEx, so this is 
first attempt. Can everybody, can you see a different screen now in the, yes. in the box? Yeah, okay. we see it. Can you see it there? Yeah, if you could. Member States' commitments were involved in the resolution adopted at the recent World Health Assembly. I urge you to offer all your support. Illness. Frustration. Shocking. The fundamental human right. We cannot ensure that the quality of care that is not complete when it The resolution is approved. Okay, thank you, Arabella, and um, we will share the link as well because we'd love for you to share this with your colleagues um, who aren't uh, aware of the resolution and to further spread um, the, the uh, commitment and, and the energy to be implementing the resolution. So I'm going to see if I can go to the next slide, though I don't the changer anymore on my screen. Perfect. Okay, so wanted to really highlight um, quality, and quality now is something that you hear people talking about throughout the health systems, and for the first time, we have an understanding that quality is really lacking. So there was a report that came out um, in 2018 by the World Bank, the OCD, and WHO that found that there were 8.6 million deaths each year due to inadequate access to quality care. Um, and of these deaths, there were 3.6 people who didn't access health care, but there were 5 million people who sought care but received poor quality care. So, this is individuals who come to healthcare facilities and actually are putting themselves at risk. And we know a lot of those risks can be addressed through fundamental wash and infection prevention control practices. We also know that up to 1 million mothers and newborns are dying every year from preventable infections linked to unclean births. So within the work on wash and healthcare facilities, we have a very strong focus on maternity settings and facilities where mothers and newborns are giving birth. And, and we also know from some of the data that we've been collecting through WASH-FIT and other surveys that often the maternity ward is the ward that is least equipped with WASH and IPC serv services. So um, one of the efforts is to try to change this to make sure that the maternity ward is addressed first. So next slide. Maggie, you should have the right to move it again now. Can oh, you just... I see it. Okay, sorry about that. Bear with okay. my... Oh, no. No, it's not advancing. Sorry about my... I don't have the arrows. Technical... No. Mm. Okay, perfect. 
No, okay, sorry. Four words. Okay, so WASH, Quality Care, and ITC. So just wanted to highlight that there's seven dimensions um, of quality care. And when you're thinking about the work that you're doing at the national level and even at the facility level, um, it's really important to, to look at these dimensions and to know um, not only the language, but to know the approaches that health colleagues are taking in particular to improve effective, safe, and people-centered care. And I just wanted to highlight that we know WASH is fundamental to IPC, but WASH also goes beyond IPC because it's about dignity, it's about equity, um, it's about the, the, the patients, but also the families having clean and safe facilities, having things like access to showers and drinking water. Um, and I think taking this holistic approach is, is really fundamental. You probably are all aware of the global data, and if you're not, I really encourage you not only to look at the global report, but to go to the, to the website, washdata.org, where you can look up your country data, where you can look up um, your regional data. So we know that one in four facilities lack basic water. We know one in five have no sanitation. Um, but we also have some pretty shocking statistics that two in five facilities do not have hand hygiene at point of care. And when we have outbreaks, like the current COVID outbreak, which is affecting pretty much every country now, the fundamental measure to, to prevent spread of, of COVID is, is hand hygiene. And if healthcare professionals, if families can't practice this, there um, are obviously huge risks and huge consequences. I, the second thing I wanted to highlight is that the um, WHO UNICEF Joint Monitoring Program, which is the program mandated to collect this data and report on the data, is now already doing the update of this baseline data. And the data is now out for country consultation. So I know that Wasina and Dr. Rashid have been facilitating this, but it's really important that in these next few weeks, if you haven't looked at the new updated figures, to make sure you take a look at those and consult with the relevant uh, government colleagues to make sure that they're accurate, to make sure that all the data has been taken into consideration. So this new update will be online on the washdata.org by the end of May and we'll be reporting on it uh, the end of this year in the Global Progress Report, which will look at not only WASH services, but also progress and implementing the resolution. Just wanted to zero in on, on WASH and infection um, prevention control supplies in delivery rooms. As I mentioned, um, for this work, it's a really important setting and a neglected setting. And you can see from these six countries, none of them have 100% of, of, of all the items. And the average is somewhere around 50%. So this is pretty shocking. And none of these items are expensive. So we know that all of these things can be improved, things such as soap. If there's not water, at least having, having buckets of water for, for hand washing and cleaning, um, disinfectants, we know all of these can be implemented fairly cheaply. Also just wanted to highlight um, the importance of WASH for present, preventing the spread of antimicrobial re resistance. Um, it's countries and facilities themselves have been able to get away almost with poor hygiene and poor WASH because we have antibiotics. In some countries, for example, 90% of women are receiving prophylactic antibiotics regardless of the condition of, of themselves or their child. And, and this is quite frightening when, when the advice is to only use antibiotics when needed. Um, so within, within um, your countries, there's a lot of work happening now around AMR national action plans. And we're really encouraging and trying to work with countries to make sure that they include specific elements of WASH in those national action plans, um, and in particular, um, measures to improve monitoring, to improve investment, to improve training around WASH in healthcare facilities. So 
just wanted to highlight the immediate timeline of, of, of what's happening around the global work and, and since the resolution. Um, for example, this year is the year of the nurse and the midwife. And again, focusing in on that, on that moment around childbirth and the role that midwives and nurses play, not only in, in demonstrating and advocating for, for better wash services and IPC practices, but also um, helping mothers and their families improve the practices um, that they're, they're doing around hand hygiene um, in, while they're giving birth, but also at home. Uh, we will be having an update of where countries are in implementing the resolution this May at the World Health Assembly. Um, and we're continuing um, to support countries on, on a very specific technical role around wash fit, which we'll be talking about tomorrow. So I, I'm looking forward to the country interventions um, and really have appreciated all the slides that have been sent in so far, um, documenting more in detail where countries are in implementing the resolution. And I hope we have time to discuss a little bit about some of the challenges and, and potential solutions for overcoming those. So there are global targets for WASH and healthcare facilities, and, and for us, these serve as really important metrics to measure where we are in ultimately achieving the 100% basic WASH services by 2030, which aligns with the SDG 6 WASH goal of achieving universal access by 2030 as, as well. So the, the aim is to incrementally uh, improve where countries are on basic services. And for countries that have already achieved these basic services, um, we are working with countries to set higher service levels. So these service levels include things around water quality. They include things around um, infection prevention control, especially in, in plumbing, as well as um, on sanitation. So happy to discuss those more specifically if if you have questions. Um, they also can obviously include uh, specific measures to make sure wash supplies um, and practices are, are climate resilient. So the resolution includes um, a number of specific actions that countries should be taking. These actions align directly with the eight practical steps, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, you can download the resolution, it's online in all the UN languages. And, and one thing I just wanted to really highlight is that throughout the resolution, it's talking about WASH and IPC. So there was a very strong recognition by the member states that these two have to go together. You, you can't have WASH services, but then not have people use them. And you can't obviously do good cleaning or hand hygiene if, if you don't have the WASH services. So these practical steps, what are they? Well, basically, these are eight steps which um, were derived from a distillation of, of success stories in 30 countries. They don't necessarily have to be done in any particular order. And often we find you know, countries are able to tackle a few of them at the same time. Uh, obviously, the, the first three, I would say, are, are really important about understanding where um, each country is, not only in terms of the actual service levels, but what are the existing health priorities, the health budgets, um, the health initiatives where WASH could and should be included, um, as well as what are the standards that facilities are being um, held to, as well as accountability mechanisms. And when we talk about accountability mechanisms, it could be um, regulations, um, it could be um, uh, certifications, um, but it also could be very local accountability mechanisms. So in Ghana, for example, they have community scorecards. And every month, the community comes together and looks at eight indicators linked to quality. So there's only one that has a wash aspect, but all of these together um, uh, are, uh, give a picture of, of where facilities are in quality. And communities then prioritize actions, and often they're engaged in, in actually facilitating actions. So simple things like building a wall around the healthcare waste area to keep out animals and small children. Uh, in the photos here, we have a photo of the wash 
CrossFit improvement in Indonesia. And I look forward to hearing more about not only that process, but what have been some of the early results. And, and that obviously is really important for Chef 4, improving infrastructure. Um, and on the bottom picture, you see um, cleaners in Ethiopia. And, and cleaners have often been a very neglected part of the health workforce. And, and we know that they're quite fundamental, not only to, to keeping facilities clean and, and, and welcoming, but also to preventing infections. So um, there's work within our team to improve our training and indicators around cleaning, but other teams um, within the Health Workforce Department, as well as AMR, are, are looking at this issue of how do we better equip and train and empower cleaners, which is number six. Okay, so there's all kinds of resources to help you, to help facilities, to help countries um, engage in these practical steps. So we've listed all the resources that are there, and many of these were developed as part of the global meeting, which was held last year in Zambia. Uh, you can find them all on the washnhcf.com um, knowledge portal. And really encourage you to take a look at these, to adapt these, and if there's things that are missing or things that you think um, WHO and UNICEF and partners should, should contribute to developing, please let us know. So what are the priorities moving forward? Well, we continue to advocate, elevate, and integrate within health. Our, our aim is within five years, this isn't led by the WASH sector, that it's really led by the health sector and, and the WASH provides more of a technical role. Um, we also are working on a number of reports and tools. So we have the global report on progress, which I mentioned, which will come out um, in December as, as part of the, the celebration for UHC Day. There's also initial work on an investment case and costing to, to help countries develop what their costed plan should look like, but also um, to encourage banks and lending institutions to make sure that not only wash infrastructure, but the sustainability and the ongoing operation and maintenance and, and staff needed for that um, operation are, are included in any kind of healthcare facility funding. Wash fit updates, which you'll hear about tomorrow, and we also are planning a webinar series on practical action. So if you're not on our newsletter and listserv, please let us know. We'll include you, and all that information will be shared there. Um, in terms of global events, regional events, um, well, we have the event now, and, and, and we do hope in the future we'll, we'll get to meet you all in person. There's also events being planned in Latin America and East Africa, as well as at the World Health Assembly. So that's it. Um, really encourage all of you to join in the communications. I wanted to highlight that on our knowledge portal, it's an interactive site, so you can post things directly, um, you can uh, share things, you can join our Twitter feed, so we really encourage you to get engaged. Uh, we will be launching a new commitment page that will list all the commitments and will also provide updates on progress and implementing commitments. So. Um, encourage you to get your commitment submitted, and you can do that directly on the page, and, and also to um, check soon to, to see what progress people are, are, are making. Um, so I have a few questions, um, and feel free to, to ask your own, and I also realize we're running short on time, so maybe some of these we can try to um, address offline as well. But just wanted to think about you to think about what are some of the first things you will do or you are already doing to address the situation, you know, looking at the near and, and longer term, where do you want to be as a, as a country, but also potentially as a region or a facility, and what are some of the top challenges do you think that are, are uh, preventing you from getting there, and, and potentially what are some ways that those could be overcome? So I'll stop there. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll hand it over to Faustina. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie, for uh, that wonderful presentation and for taking us through the Washington CF links with health and introduction to the eight practical steps. 
Um, and thank you for also highlighting uh, the deal that I've been sending to a number of countries here on compiling the progress on the country tracker. So I, we have received a response from only Bangladesh, and um, we're still awaiting response uh, from the other countries. So hopefully we should be able to hear from them soon. Um, moving ahead, we now have a, a presentation by Dr. Anjana Bhushan on the ensuring cleaner, safer health facilities. Uh, Dr. Anjana, you have the floor now. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, and my slides. Uh... Hi, Anjana. If you move, you should be able to move the slides on, and your slides should be the next one um, immediately there. Can you see the toolbar on the left hand side of your screen? Um, what should okay? This way? Oh, sorry, keep going. There's a few. There okay, all right. Thank you, everyone, and uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I'll uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the work that I, work I do in the health system development department. Uh, and, um, of course, uh, in partnership with uh, our environmental health colleagues and others who work on this issue of improving quality and safety uh, in health facilities. <clears throat> in the health system development department, we see this as a core dimension of sustainable universal health coverage and progress towards that goal. Uh, which is just what my first slide says. Uh, just to illustrate, um, you may know about target 3.8 uh, in Sustainable Development Goal 3, uh, which is the UHC goal. And there you have the word quality and safe, uh, which illustrates that quality and safety are core to the definition of UHC. Uh, this is another slide that uh, conveys the same idea that what we call integrated people-centered health services uh, are a non-starter without these services being safe and of adequate quality uh, to be effective. Um, Maggie went over some of this evidence, and so I will uh, not need to belabor this point, but um, when we started reviewing this issue late in 2018 in the regional office, uh, the trigger was three global reports that came out on uh, quality and safety of care. Uh, one is the Lancet Commission report. The second is a joint report by WHO, the World Bank, and OECD that Maggie referenced. And the third was uh, a report by the National Academies of Sciences in the US all of them giving huge um, visibility to the issue of uh, improving uh, the quality and safety of healthcare. And uh, particularly the Lancet Commission said that it's now time for a revolution because uh, while countries have been working on this issue for decades, uh, much of the work is still um, not at scale and it's still at the margin, it's not, uh, uh, there's still a long road ahead. And what we heard and what we uh, felt when we reviewed was that progress towards universal health coverage are going, is going to be constrained unless we can look at this issue, especially at the frontline service level or the primary care level, because we see a lot of bypassing of care related to lack of trust in the low quality of care at this level. Um, I'll uh, not go over this evidence, it's with you, and it comes from the Lancet Commission, uh, but uh, suffice it to say that it echoes uh, the sort of evidence that Maggie um, cited from, uh, from the WHO World Bank and OECD report. I also just wanted, while we're on this slide, to call your attention to the fact that, um, of course, the situation in low and middle income countries is particularly of concern because this is where the global burden of adverse events related to poor quality or unsafe care occur. <clears throat> uh, 
And the last point on this slide is quite important, that even when you have supplies available at the facility level, we have quite low adherence to IC, IPC practices like hand hygiene and several other practices at the level of individual um, healthcare providers and staff. Uh, more evidence on weak adherence to evidence-based guidelines and diagnostic accuracy. Uh, we looked at the evidence in our region, and for this, we actually reviewed um, service availability and readiness assessments across different uh, or their equivalent surveys across different countries in the region. And what we called basic amenities, uh, Maggie also showed some of this data, improved water, um, a latrine, a private consultation room, electricity, a phone or a radio for communication, and an emergency transport. Very variable levels of availability, and in some cases, very low. So these are the basic building blocks of clean and safe care. And across our countries in our region, they are quite low. Um, I'll skip, I won't dwell very much on this slide, but this is about um, uh, the quality of care in an era of NCD. Uh, suffice to say that this is uh, one of the emerging challenges. Maggie referred to the focus on clean and safe deliveries uh, to improve maternal and child health outcomes. Uh, and this is sort of our um, next generation issue that we have to tackle uh, at the level of our um, frontline services in particular. Um, this is an important piece of evidence, uh, and this is the percentage of upper respiratory tract infections in which an antibiotic is prescribed. And these are different studies from across our region. Uh, if you have a, a suspiciously high level of antibiotic prescription, some of these will be needed, of course, but others are probably overused. And um, this uh, leads to uh, antimicrobial resistance. And as we know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So it's much better to prevent preventable infection uh, rather than have this kind of a situation. Um, we have a regional strategy for patient safety in this region uh, with these six elements, six pillars. Um, the first is about having a system-based approach to quality and safety. The second is to have a way of reporting and learning from uh, uh, the, the adverse events that are occurring. The third is about having a competent and capable workforce. Uh, the fourth pillar is squarely about healthcare-associated infection and therefore having robust IPC in place. The fifth is uh, to improve the implementation of global campaigns. Many of you must be working on these campaigns uh, or may have heard of them, such as safe surgery, safe childbirth, safe injections, and many other types of safe practices. And the sixth is about improving research and evidence in these areas. We've conducted assessments in most of our member states and uh, across these six pillars uh, and assigned, uh, so we've supported our member states to do these assessments and member states have assigned the red, yellow, or green traffic light indicator system where uh, what we see across member states is that Many, if not most of our countries do have high level mechanisms or strategies or policies in place. They've begun to look at indicators. They've begun to develop action plans, especially in areas like antimicrobial resistance or labs and blood uh, safety. Uh, but there's a long, long way to go, especially with regard to knowing the scale of the occurrence of adverse events. Uh, with having a competent workforce and making sure that uh, health workers are following practices even where supplies are available, and having what we call a risk-based approach uh, to safe care. So assessing high risk and um, focusing on areas of high risk 
rather than spreading ourselves thin across a multitude of areas. We do a two yearly progress report to our governing body, the regional committee, uh, every year uh, since the 10 uh, year strategy was approved. And the most recent report was uh, in October last year. And these are some of the key findings from that progress report. What we see is that uh, there is steadily increased commitment to this agenda as core to the universal health coverage uh, agenda. And uh, most of our member states, as I mentioned, have governance mechanisms in the forms of in the form of policies or strategies. Several of our countries are using uh, tools such as accreditation of workers as well as of facilities. We also see that lots of work in the region is ongoing through various programs, such as maternal and child health programs, our partners uh, in IPC and WASH and in AMR. Um, all of our member states are doing training. The question is, what impact are trainings having on practice? Um, we don't have a lot of data and information because most routine health, health information systems actually don't yet incorporate uh, indicators on quality and safety. And most significantly, we really found the lack of evidence on a culture of quality and safety in healthcare facilities. So this is a, a big need, especially by engaging patients, their families, and communities. Uh, we tried to map against um, the framework of the Lancet Commission what types of interventions are common. Um, and the, the Lancet Commission finds that uh, the most common are micro-level interventions, but they are commonly not taken to scale. So this was um, our concern. So we convened a consultation of experts about a year ago, uh, and we asked them about their advice on how can we um, increase momentum around the issue, uh, because a lot of work has been happening over decades, but how can we accelerate or create a sense of urgency? And these are their key recommendations. Uh, they said that uh, we, in order to ignite demand or create a sense of urgency, uh, we, should, um, we should increase awareness, especially among new stakeholders like parliamentarians and the public, particularly building on global momentum around WASH and IPC, uh, especially because WASH had this global um, resolution that we just uh, uh, the previous presenters talked about. Uh, they also asked us to improve communication around the issue and policy advocacy around the issue. And they suggested why not develop something like a dashboard, uh, something like a fit for service dashboard, which brings together available evidence on cleaner, safer health facilities and share it with member states as part of our annual progress monitoring that we do share with member states on universal health coverage and use this tool as a policy advocacy tool, as a communication tool, but also to drive um, acceleration efforts in countries. And the third recommendation was to have targets against which progress could be monitored and at the regional committee to actually have member states commit something like mid-decade acceleration targets because we are from this year we are a decade away from the SDG deadline. And so can member states set for themselves uh, mid-decade targets? And finally, to focus on health worker capacity, not just in terms of training, but also complying. And particularly to look at district level facility management and manager uh, capability. So just to end, we took the advice of the experts and we sat down with a handful of those experts and developed this dashboard that you see in front of you, which we call the Fit for Service Dashboard. Um, it looks at three broad areas, clean facilities, safe facilities, and effective services. So a little bit like the input um, process 
output continuum that we often see in the quality and safety literature. And uh, while the slide you see in front of you is a mock-up for country X, what we did was that we took, we made a long list of indicators that for which uh, countries are already uh, collecting information. And then we shortlisted from those about two dozen indicators, which are the ones that you see here. And uh, if we had at least five to six countries in the region for whom data were available, we did put it into the dashboard. Um, as you can see from the clean facilities portion of this dashboard, uh, the data relate to basic wash services. And we've taken the numbers from the uh, joint monitoring report baseline uh, report that came out in June last year. Uh, the data, the indicators that we picked uh, are at national level, but also at sub-national level to the extent uh, available. Uh, for safe facilities, we've looked at other inputs and um, IPC type issues, and also the availability of guidelines on various um, important priorities. Um, and under effective services, we've tried to focus on outcomes. So this is a, this is a summary of the type of um, the type of measures we would like countries to begin thinking about and tracking for themselves. Where does this dashboard go next? Uh, well, first of all, we've shared it with our member states at a, a regional consultation on frontline services that we conducted last year. And then we've also informally shared it with um, policymakers and politicians at our regional committee. The next step will be to disseminate this in countries through you, the country offices, and our counterparts, and to encourage countries to adapt and use this, this uh, framework for tracking, for target setting and tracking uh, their own progress uh, or your own progress uh, towards 2030 and also to use it as a tool to compare because um, the indicators are similar for across the 11 uh, countries in the region, the same set of indicators. So to use it as a comparative tool and spur a sort of a healthy regional uh, competition. Uh, we do hope in due course uh, to take this dashboard uh, to an electronic platform where countries can then update it in real time. Uh, we were conscious that we didn't want to increase the reporting burden of countries, and so we've taken available data from um, available services or small studies in some cases uh, just to keep the reporting burden low. Um, I think uh, in concluding, i just like to emphasize that there is fresh attention to positioning primary health care or the frontline level as uh, the key level at which our UHC acceleration efforts need to focus. And this, I think, uh, goes the same for um, quality and safe care. Uh, and for this, we do need countries to start transitioning the way they're thinking about primary level care, including to think about how they can do some really basic things to improve the basics, whether it's in terms of input, uh, health worker capacity, or facility policies and management practices, but to improve the real basics uh, at the frontline level and how to link this to secondary care. We recognize that managing these changes at the country level is both a technical challenge in terms of the technical solutions, the tools, the implementation tools, but also a political challenge where uh, political commitment and the resources would need to be brought to bear on this agenda. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Anjana, for that presentation. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I had forgotten to take, take questions when uh, Maggie had presented. So we'll have questions for Maggie's presentation first, followed by questions for Dr. Anjana. So uh, going with the first uh, set of questions for Maggie's presentation. 
Do we have countries uh, with questions for Maggie? Moving ahead uh, to Dr. Anjana's presentation, do we have any questions for Dr. Anjana? Uh, Faustina, I see three questions in the chat box already, right. um, or more than three. Um, maybe I can start with those. Yeah, sure. Yeah. One is around the patient safety assessments. Uh, this is from HQ. I'm uh, happy to share uh, that as well as the tool. Uh, one of the things we found uh, is that there is no dearth of tools. For example, there was a question previously around infection prevention and control and whether uh, WashFit includes IPC. And you may know that WHO headquarters has uh, some very, very comprehensive guidelines around um, <clears throat> the eight core components of IPC programs at national and facility level. Uh, along with a set of assessment tools at national and facility level that focus on these eight core components. And HQ, our colleagues at HQ have also developed um, a minimum requirements version of these guidelines. And I think with the coronavirus outbreak and other um, unacceptably high levels of unsafe care, um, I think that these kind of um, guidance documents and implementation support tools uh, become very useful. Um, then the, there's a question around including quality in, uh, in HMIS. Um, this is ongoing work and our fit for service dashboard is a humble contribution towards that same effort. Um, there are uh, global indicators for measuring progress towards UHC more generally. And then, as you know, there are program by program indicators, and all of these are part of countries' HMIS systems. Um, as yet, uh, there are few indicators that measure uh, quality and safe care, good quality and safe care, uh, including, uh, to my knowledge, no measures around um, adverse events or healthcare associated infections or other dimensions of IPC. So the challenge is to come up with a very small set of very telling indicators. The Lancet Commission found that there are multiple indicators, but um, and there's in fact too many indicators, but what's missing is uh, the ability to sit down and talk about what picture the indicators are showing, and that's why we thought that uh, the dashboard might be a useful way of conveying that picture in one glance. The link for the two yearly progress report on our patient safety strategy uh, is available on our governing body website, and I'll be happy to share it with Faustina so that she can uh, disseminate it forward to everybody. Um, and the last question is, uh, well, there's a question around whether the regional committee has taken up uh, the issue of universal wash in all healthcare facilities. I think that may be for Maggie. Um, I think those are the questions for, for me, as far as I can tell, unless others have more questions. Over. Do you hear me? Hello? Yes, Hello? I can hear you very well. Yeah, I'm from Timor Leste. Please go ahead. My question is uh, based on the the report uh, you present. Um, just the question is: uh, <clears throat> there are many components and requirements, but um, we have in different uh, health level. Did the all requirements? or minimum standard can apply for the whole level of the health facility because uh, every country we have uh, the level of facilities different. We have 
in the low level and the high level, like uh, from health post level, community health center level, um, and the referral hospital and national hospital. Uh, do the all requirement, all, all minimum standard can apply for whole level or each, each level is different? Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, I yeah. will respond in two ways. Number one, as far as WASH in healthcare facilities goes, I would um, refer you back to the JMP ladder, as it's called. Um, uh, there is a ladder of, uh, there, it's a WASH service ladder, um, which describes uh, no services, limited services, and basic services with regard to water, sanitation, hygiene, waste management, and cleaning. And what we are suggesting to all countries... Yes, is please, that I hear you. Yeah. All countries must have the basic service level for all five of these areas by 2030. So that's one part of the answer. Uh, the second part of the answer, if I heard you correctly, your question was around minimum requirements. My, I refer to minimum requirements in uh, regard to the guidance that WHO has produced on infection prevention and control. So WHO has uh, guidance documents on the eight core components of infection prevention and control at national level and at healthcare facility level. And last year, uh, WHO has revised these guidelines and produced minimum requirements, that is, if, if countries can't do everything across these eight areas, across the eight core components, what is the basic minimum that they must do for IPC at national and health facility level? And this, this minimum requirements document makes a distinction between primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of care. So what is it that is minimum at the level of the primary care facility? versus um, higher standards at higher levels of facility. So these are available online and I'm able to actually share this uh, with everybody. Thank you. Christina, this is Maggie and maybe there was a question in the chat and also by Timor Lise about um, should all facilities have the same level of service? And I think the answer is no. I think that ideally we get to a point where all facilities have higher levels of service because even the basic level is inadequate. It doesn't look at water quality. It doesn't look at water sufficiency. But I think, um, you know, obviously in facilities where you have patients who are at higher risk, which typically is hospitals, you need to think about higher levels of service and, and issues around water quality, issues around what's happening with your waste streams, especially with the fecal matter. So at the global level, it's very hard to define these higher levels of service because they will be so dependent on the countries and on the particular situation. But we have several examples of what some of those um, indicators are, and happy to share those with you, and they're also on, on the knowledge portal. Over. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Anjana and Maggie, for uh, taking all those questions so patiently. And um, I guess uh, if we have no more questions uh, for both of them, we will move on to the next part of the session, which is a very interesting part where we'll have uh, countries uh, discuss their interventions, including uh, the progress on eight steps uh, highlighted by Maggie in her presentation. Uh, at this point, I will hand over the floor to Arabella and Maggie to uh, intervene and uh, take the session forward. Arabella, over to you. Hi, Fasina. Thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe if we go in alphabetical order, start with Bangladesh, if I 
I think you're first in the alphabet, so maybe if, if you have the floor, if you want to um, mention one, stick to one key challenge, something you're working on, a reflection from um, the session today, and um, in the interest of time, you can try and keep it brief. Over to you. Yes. This is Walula from Bangladesh. Um, the country's situation, uh, I have with me uh, Dr. Farjana Munmun from Directorate of Health Services. Uh, I will request her to uh, explain the situation or describe the situation of healthcare facilities, uh, washing healthcare facilities status in Bangladesh. Please, uh, Munmun. Thank you. Uh, hope uh, all are uh, listening to me. Is it okay? Yeah, all clear. Yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, first, the situation analysis. Uh, in respect of, uh, we have um, washed the bottleneck analysis. We conducted in all healthcare facilities. Uh, and here, uh, the government officials of different level, uh, district and federal level managers are also uh, included. And they have also uh, engaged with us to uh, develop a five-year implementation plan. And we uh, set some targets uh, for the national strategy of our uh, WASH in healthcare facility uh, for five-year plan 2019 to 2023. So this is uh, already uh, in uh, draft final level. So we are uh, we are now, now uh, uh, in the level of uh, costed implementation plan. And uh, we also develop uh, national standards and accountability mechanism, uh, like uh, national standards and guidelines for washing facility has been drafted and also in finalization. <coughs> And we have also the national technical team where the Ministry of Health and uh, Director General of Health Services, different district and popular levels, and the national and uh, international NGOs are also involved with the National Technical Committee, where the WHO, uh, UNICEF, uh, WaterAid, uh, all are uh, in, uh, involved in, in this uh, national technical team. And then uh, improvement of the uh, infrastructure and maintenance. Uh, this is uh, uh, done uh, on on the basis of the requirement and urgency and the availability of funds. This is not in regular basis. And uh, here I would like to mention that the government and NGOs and some stakeholders uh, like uh, local government uh, representatives or political leaders are also involved in the uh, infrastructure improvement also. And uh, in operational maintenance, we are, uh, we are in this stage, like uh, in the community clinic level, we, are, we have a maintenance operation guideline with us, and we are uh, now planning to disseminate it uh, with the whole country level. But uh, the district and above hospital levels, we are now uh, developing the operation maintenance guideline for Washington Healthcare Facility. And, and, uh, uh, monitoring and review. Uh, we are in in this level. We are in challenges that uh, uh, level that uh, we uh, in the discussion we found that some of the countries also the situation that for national HMI system it is not incorporated uh, actually uh, it is not uh, incorporated yet. So we are planning about the uh, indicators of what should be the indicators. Uh, so in the training session we found our dashboard. So we are uh, we are also thinking about the uh, dashboard and what should be the indica uh, indicators. So it is uh, helpful for us uh, to uh, uh, work yep. with this uh, dashboard, which is shown in this session. And workforce development, uh, in sense of uh, wash feed, we are also uh, conducting in district level, uh, like uh, in process budget, we have uh, these types of training. So we are now planning to uh, disseminate the national wide uh, wash pit training because uh, this type of training is also necessary for the workforce, like in private sector, also in the government sector and private sector also. And you um, maybe you already know that uh, in community clinic uh, who are providing the uh, primary health care services in the rural area, 
So in the community clinic, already the community people <coughs> are engaged in the community clinic. So they are working with the community group and community support group. And also there are local government involvement. So we are now, uh, we also you know, find, found some uh, initiative from the local government that they are already engaged in these sectors, but it, this is not regular, uh, regular basis. So we are now thinking that how this, all the local government and all the community group uh, will orient it in this uh, wash uh, matters. And in- Super, I, I, maybe I could just interrupt you there. I'm so sorry to cut you off. I'm just conscious um, in the interest of time, um, we want to have enough time to hear from the other countries. So maybe I, I can wrap, we can wrap up um, that, that update there. And I believe that we'll share, we'll share all of the presentations, um, the country presentations that you have prepared before the session. We'll share those around with participants um, after this call. Uh, and perhaps as um, homework, if you like, or some, if you have some time between now and tomorrow, I advise you to take a look at those slides so you can read more about the updates um, that you shared there. But thank you very much. It's great to hear that Bangladesh is doing so much um, and uh, appreciate that update. Uh, so maybe we can move on to the next country. Um, I think maybe to Indonesia. I think that's next in the alphabet. Um, Indonesia, you have the floor if you're able to speak. And again, please just, just focus on one to two um, main points. Uh, we don't have time, sadly, to go through everything um, today. Over to you. I can see you all in the video, but we can't hear anything. Well, Hello, Postina. Hi, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, yeah, so um, we are here uh, from Indonesia. We just would like to update uh, briefly about uh, what we have done so far. So, in regards to the um, in regards to the uh, first element which is the situation analysis, we have done actually the national survey of the healthcare facilities. 2019, and it's covered around uh, almost uh, 10,000 of primary health care services and 530 hospitals. And uh, the um, the analyze the further analyze of the uh, of this survey uh, is actually underway. And uh, Actually, that we don't have a, any specific target on the work in the healthcare facilities uh, yet, but uh, this is sort of embedded in our national target of the accredited uh, primary healthcare uh, facility uh, and also uh, integrated in the MOH strategic planning 2020 and 2024. So uh, I think we need to also sharpen for the next futures and uh, to be more specific on the work in healthcare facilities. And uh, in regards to the to our commitment in uh, the work in healthcare facilities, uh, we I think uh, we have structured or planned uh, the workshop on the healthcare facilities, work in healthcare facilities, probably we uh, conduct uh, conduct a base workshop. Uh, next month or this uh, last uh, in the last week of this month, and uh, we will invite uh, some of uh, some of the uh, primary healthcare facilities and also some of the provincial and uh, the uh, district health officers, and as well as uh, the multi-sectoral uh, unit within the Ministry of Health. This is actually to advocate and uh, increase the awareness uh, of the work in healthcare facilities, as well as uh, introduce this work fit. So I think this is the short, uh, uh, what do you call it, planning that we need to uh, conduct. And uh, apart from that, um, we also had a chance to uh, 
utilize our DVAT, money, uh, DVAT fund for uh, piloting the wash fit in uh, some of the uh, primary healthcare facilities in uh, our region. So we'll uh, also implement that. And apart from, from that, uh, we in the workshop itself, we plan to have also sort of um, in initial uh, activity to draft the roadmap. And uh, I think this is pretty much what we are planning right now. And probably uh, during the implementation of the piloting, we may also develop an uh, Indonesian context on the what's uh, in healthcare facility guidelines uh, to also uh, develop like a building uh, capacity for healthcare workers uh, in Indonesia. I think that's the update from uh, Indonesia. Over to you. Super, thank you so much for that update. Great again to hear so much is going on. Um, and it'd be great to share the results of that uh, national survey once those are available. I'm sure there'll be many who are interested to, to see that report um, and to hear the outcomes of your uh, healthcare facility workshop um, when that takes place. Um, maybe then moving on in the interest of time um, to Myanmar, uh, if you have. Uh, the microphone and you're able to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, the national policy and strategy uh, governing Washington Capital City is the national strategy and investment plan, which is uh, published in 2016, and it also includes Washington institution like uh, Washington School and Washington Capital City. And then this year 2020, we have drafted the national urea sanitation and hygiene policy and, and cost of land. And in case of baseline data for washing health care facility, we lack data 2018, but we update the national heart information system in 2019 and we incorporated uh, one new portion that is called washing health care facility. Uh, so uh, very soon, uh, we are receiving the first. Uh, National data relating to Washington hair care facility. And then, with the support of UNICEF, uh, uh, in 2020, April, we are conducting a national, first time national uh, baseline survey for Washington hair care facility. Uh, we, will, uh, we will use our online system. Uh, we, we sent the, the question. The question form via the templates, and we would use on online system uh, to collect data from the Washington healthcare facility, uh, the all types of uh, healthcare facility like uh, like hospital and rural health, rural health center and sub center uh, uh, all over the country. We hope we will get the result or survey at the end of uh, April. And now, and then we we in this year 2020, we have already developed uh, zero draft or uh, you know, wash and hair care facility, uh, minimum st uh, standard for wash and, hair, uh, wash and hair care facility. To develop this uh, this minimum standard, we and the, the baseline uh, and document is the uh, uh, we refer to environmental health center in hair care uh, service 2018 by WHO. Uh, after having the uh, service of the reserve, uh, uh, we will conduct three workshops. Uh, you know, four workshops in different parts of the country, especially in hilly area uh, and coastal area, and then in the central plain area. And we will finalize the uh, um, minimum guideline of Washington care facility by adjusting the local care needs. Uh, this was supported uh, supported by UNICEF, and, and and we are expecting that uh, national minimum guideline will be developed uh, at the end of June. And this is the one point I would like to share. And um, and as you know, the the healthcare waste management is uh, the one of the important part of uh, uh, Washington healthcare facility. Uh, last year, 2019, we developed national standard for. Uh, Healthcare waste management, and according to the uh, level of healthcare facility, uh, with and and we also got support from Warban to fulfill the uh, the the with the standard uh, provided in in healthcare waste management guideline uh, 
I, I and we tested two pilot projects in, in two different areas of the country regarding to that healthcare waste management guideline, uh, uh, guideline especially for shark uh, shark waste management. I included this this pilot project in our success story. Uh, in case of uh, green and climate resilient uh, and healthcare facility, it is quite new for us. But uh, fortunately, we got uh, the uh, global environmental facility fund, uh, fund for for the, for the least developed country. So, oh, no, the, uh, it is a four-year project, and this is the second year of the implementation. So, in this year, we already developed a proposal and sent to the WHO, and 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 which is about to write that uh, to write the minimum requirement of uh, 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 and climate resilient healthcare facility. In this uh, in this guideline, we will will include uh, four priority area. We, one is the water, another one is the uh, one is the wash. Uh, uh, the wash have been including waste or uh, healthcare waste and waste water deposit. And the second priority is the infrastructure, uh, climate resilient infrastructure of the healthcare facility. And the third one, in, in the energy and environmental uh, friendly technology in health service delivery. We will uh, uh, we will develop that guideline. I, I with the support of GEF and and we we intended to uh, construct a, a model building so that uh, so that uh, by by landing in this model building uh, every other uh, facility can uh, you know the room model uh, of this uh, of this building and and and, and I, I hope that there will be a lot of uh, a lot of healthcare facilities which uh, uh, Climate, uh, 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 climate resilient very soon. Thank you so much. Super, another great update with lots going on. Um, particularly interested to hear about the cost of plan that you're developing. It's great to know there's another baseline survey, um, another country with a baseline survey being done and that drafting minimum standards. So many actions related to the, the practical steps. Um, I'm very conscious of the time, so just before I move on um, and call on the next country, um, please, if if you're able to stay on on the line um, and continue for a few minutes more, that would be fantastic. But I appreciate it's getting late in the day for um, for many of you. Um, and um, just to mention for those of you who do need to drop off off the WebEx soon. Um, these country updates are really fantastic, and um, it's a, a great shame that we're not in in uh, Bangladesh altogether this week to discuss them in much more detail. We are planning to run a webinar series um, this year, and the first um, episode of that series, if you like, is scheduled to take place in early April. Um, we had just we were just about to start contacting countries and asking if there was anybody who would be willing to present and share some of their updates and progress related to the eight practical steps. But hearing these very short updates, it's clear that there's lots to be shared. So if anybody is interested to um, participate and, and give a, a longer update to share um, an update on one or more of the eight practical steps, then we would love to hear from you. Uh, so either make a, a comment in the chat box or we'll follow up um, with a, a group email that all the participants uh, after this webinar with some more information about when it will take place and um, the sorts of things that we're looking uh, to, to have countries share on that webinar. Okay, so um, then next, I think alphabetically we're, uh, Nepal is next. Nepal, are you still on the line? Are you able uh, to share a very brief update? Are you still there? I think Sudan, you were uh, on the line. Sure that we can. Sorry. Oh, hi uh, there. Now it's okay. Uh, this is uh, Sudan. 
from Nepal. Just I start with about the assessment. Uh, Nepal did the health facility survey in 2015, and based on that survey, GMP baseline data was reported. And now this year, Nepal government is going to do health facility survey again, and we have included many indicators related to washing health facilities. Uh, if we talk about the target, uh, still now we are following the global target like PSDG and from this year, government has uh, planned to develop roadmap for washing health facility, but it has not been started yet. And WHO and GIZ are going to support to develop that roadmap and Standards, yes, we started to develop the washing health facility standards since last three years back, and still that standards is at draft level because of some legal issues, because of this uh, government, three tire of governments, uh, this standard has not been approved yet, but we are hoping it will be approved by government very soon. Uh, improvement and maintenance here. Yeah, this WASPIT tool has been initiated in seven health facilities of seven provinces of Nepal with minimum budget, our regular budget from WHO country office. But uh, after last year, government already started to allocate some budget for WASPIT. Not only government, other partners like WaterAid, TDS, they are also supporting for WASPIT, particularly one district uh, taking as a pilot district. And based on that, we monitoring and review data there, Nepal, we don't have very specific uh, tool for that, but uh, after this standard, certainly we will start for the monitoring and review. Health workforce, if we are talking recently, uh, Nepal has developed a uh, draft integrated washing health facility training package, including healthcare waste management, and many partners supported to develop that training package. And one TOT already completed in last January, and it is very good initiation from the Ministry of Health and. Engagement of the uh, community, uh, we don't have any problem because by law, management committee must be there in every health facility and there is obviously engagement of local leaders and other community members as the management team. Uh, these are the some uh, points uh, from Nepal side. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sudan, for that update from the call. Um, I'm very glad to hear you mentioned uh, healthcare waste management, which we haven't yet touched on today, um, but is of course a very important part of what sometimes um, left behind, uh, and is and is well integrated into the wash fit framework. So we'll touch on that tomorrow. Um, but it also um, tomorrow I'll also explain some more about what resources are available to help support the different technical areas, um, the training materials and things that will be made available um, to you all shortly. Okay, I think um, the last two Ciara countries we have are um, Sri Lanka and Timor-Leste, unless I've missed any off. Um, so we pass to Sri Lanka. We're able to... Uh, this is uh, Virginia from the country office. Before our counterpart in the Ministry of Health uh, gives some more details, I just want to uh, update you regarding uh, conducting of the service availability and readiness assessment survey in 2018. Based on the data collected uh, at the SARA survey, we were able to update the JV, JMP report last year. In addition, uh, healthcare waste management guidelines were revised in 2018. In, uh, and we were able to provide the uh, technical assistance through an international consultant. And uh, uh, now, uh, beginning of 2019, we have been uh, providing technical and financial assistance to the Ministry of Health to 
initiate an occupational health and safety program for health care workers in Sri Lanka. And at the same time, the Ministry of Health is uh, doing a huge project on reorganization of the primary health care system in Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, the um, Ministry of Health is uh, planning to uh, uh, pilot the wash pit in selected uh, health care facilities. So I will um, ask uh, Dr. Bhupika and Dr. Roshan Jayasuri, who has uh, uh, this, uh, involved in this uh, process, to update you on the activities going on uh, conducted by the Minister of Health uh, so far. Over to you, Bhupika. We're not hearing you. I'm not sure if you're uh, joining from a different username. Uh, were you able to hear what I told? Yes, we could hear you loud and clear. Okay. okay. Uh, so I see Buddhika and Dr. Roshan is in the uh, communication, but I don't see them joining. Uh, so I will move to the next country then. Okay, thank you very much. And if you're okay. able to share any other updates uh, by email or um, in okay. tomorrow's session, oh, we'll then do. please feel free. We'll do. Okay. 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 Um, <coughs> last but not least, over to Timon. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Good, good evening. Uh, I'm Titi speaking um, from WHO Control of Timor Leste. I think uh, one of colleagues from Minister of Health was here, uh, participated, but I still left. So I think uh, thank you very much uh, to hosting this in an oh? interesting Hello? topics. Hello? Hello, I am Dr. Buddhika from uh, Sri Lanka. Can you hear me? Hi, Dr. Budika. We can hear you. We're just having the update from Timor Leste, so maybe we'll just come back to you. Can I? Can okay. I okay. You? okay. 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 Hello. Hello. Uh, can Can I continue? Timor Leste. Yes, Timor Leste. Please go ahead. Yes. Um. Uh, thanks for hosting this meeting. An uh, interesting meeting. I think it's interesting topic also. Uh, for us uh, to learn more about that. Uh, was in health facility. I think from Timor Leste, I think uh, one of colleagues from Water Aid, uh, Timor Leste, also participated, uh, Mr. Cipriano. He was uh, asking me earlier. So I will be, uh, uh, after I give the update, I will offer to him to also add some uh, information from Water Aid. Uh, from Timor Leste, I think um, some of the uh, activity we have. Uh, than related to healthcare facilities um, on was uh, I think three, three years back uh, we when we implemented the water safety plan I think there was uh, some uh, uh, was in healthcare facilities uh, one of uh, important uh, issue how to link to the implementing this program so I think that some of pilot uh, project we considering the, how to uh, also link this uh, I, I did this project also over and uh, and we we are going to continue to uh, uh, strengthen the these uh, activities uh, with support from the global environmental facilities so I think now we uh, we are fighting with climate change and water plan. Uh, and then I think we last year we completed the uh, develop uh, uh, training modules uh, for integrated incorporated water safety plan training module that was developed. And I think the uh, UNICEF also done assessment done last years, and I think uh, also then was in healthcare. 
facilities. Um, and the there is uh, some steps we have uh, done, like one, three, one, two, three steps. I think considering some assessment done, I think implementing what was in the facility standards is developed. But the, the Minister of Health uh, still uh, uh, keep the document and to continue to endorsement of the discussion council of the directorate. So I think the, the UNICEF will support on this uh, activity. So they maybe, they may hopefully can this year, they will uh, try to submit the council of director of minister of to approve. And I think the so some of challenges we during this time we face is I think uh, lack of lack of uh, resources, funding allocation from the government side, uh, taking ownership. This is important for them uh, to and was as important uh, in healthcare facilities uh, to in the primary healthcare. Um, and then I think a lot of uh, and also human resources has to be considered um, from implementing the wars in healthcare facilities. So I think the WHO side has continue to approach uh, the Minister of Health and Minister of Public Work how to scaling up water safety plan to integrate also to uh, was in healthcare facilities also part important how to consider in the when they uh, implement in the improvement plan for water sub, uh, water supply system should be considering uh, how to link the, this uh, issue uh, in the in implementation uh, process. So I think that's uh, from Timor Leste uh, from WHO uh, and I think I over to uh, my colleagues, Mr. Cipriano, to update as well for for the, their activities. I think I over to Mr. Cipriano from WaterX. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sorry, everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Just, um, just quickly to update, uh, there are uh, what rate part uh, related to the wars in healthcare facility. Firstly, I would like to say my uh, great thank you for uh, WHO to host this um, very great event. So, uh, <clears throat> in the, last, uh, uh, the water rate also um, uh, in the, our intense program, we will implement the uh, wars in healthcare facility. But, uh, 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 not directly, but through the, uh, the partner of implementation. And we work close with the Minister of Health and the public service in at the national and uh, municipality, municipality level or district level. Actually, uh, for water rate in Timor Leste, we just cover uh, two municipalities. Uh, in terms of the uh, was in healthcare facility, uh, at the uh, at the municipality, municipality level, we established a uh, very strong um, uh, our relationship with the local government from the district up to um, suku level. Because at the suku level, we have the uh, uh, help us. Uh, when we talk about the wash in healthcare facility, uh, as you know that uh, every country we have uh, uh, different uh, different. Uh, uh, context. So, um, uh, in the two, two years, we already implemented four uh, system in uh, four health posts. Uh, health uh, health posts. Um, the the one challenge is because um, in the last two years, uh, UNICEF, uh, Water Aid, and Minister of uh, Minister of Health asked, asked to say that we do the. Uh, some assessment for healthcare facility, but now uh, water rate uh, water rate project is just based on the global requirement. Uh, the one challenge is until now we don't have the our um, uh, 
the standard, the national standard for uh, healthcare facility. Even now, uh, still in the Ministry of Health uh, to approve it, but uh, we we just based on the the global standard and the uh, global standard uh, for washing healthcare facility uh, as required. So uh, we all have very strong relationship with the. Uh, um, the local government uh, at the municipality and up to the health uh, uh, health post uh, level um, in was in healthcare facility focusing is to cover we build the the, the facility the very inclusive facility not just um, we mean that not just the access for the normal people but also for uh, how to uh, make it easy for the all uh, people with the disability to get uh, to get the access to the uh, to the facility. That's uh, just um, just want to update a few the few things what the water rate uh, did for the what uh, health was in healthcare facility in uh, our region. I think uh, only that's all I would like to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that update, and it's great to have WaterAid um, on the call who are doing lots of great work across the region um, and are a, um, a big advocate for this work. So thank you for that update. Um, lastly, then, just to go back to our colleague from the um, government in Sri Lanka. So yeah. back to you, Boudicca, uh, and then we'll wrap up for the, for the day. Over to you. Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Sorry, earlier my call uh, call was muted, so I couldn't speak. Right? Uh, Sri, uh, Sri Lanka, we have very good health system comprising of preventive and uh, curative health system. Preventive system, we have that in antenatal clinics and all uh, comes under medical office of health system and pre uh, curative system. At the moment, we have a good hospital system, and now we have started primary healthcare strengthening system. Under that, we are developing small hospitals with all the healthcare facilities, including wash facilities. And regarding healthcare waste management, we have entered into tripartite agreement between Ministry of Health and Central Environment Authority and also private sector organization to collect all waste and manage manage healthcare waste. And provincial uh, then main main hospitals will be covered under this project and also apart from that local governments also also help in healthcare waste management. Apart from that, we conduct regular training programs on wash regarding wash for healthcare staff. And also we conduct regular surveillance activities regarding water quality. We have we have improved water source. Anyway, we conduct uh, take some water samples regularly and conduct the water quality surveillance to check the quality of water. These are the main activities regarding wash in our healthcare facilities. Thank you very much for that update um, and for keeping it so succinct as well. Um, great to have heard from all the countries today um, and we are so appreciative, appreciative to have you all still on the line with us now. Um, we are wrapping up um, now. Just to mention uh, before I pass back to um, Alcina to close, um, for our session tomorrow, we'll be um, going into detail on the wash fit methodology, providing um, an overview of the methodology, what resources are available to help support that, and how um, there was a question earlier about how that links to the practical steps. Um, WASHFIT is, is just one of the, the practical steps to improve, um, to help you improve and maintain uh, infrastructure, but also how it links into quality of care and addresses some of these other issues that we've talked about, so climate, um, quality of care. IPC, AMR, some good questions coming up in the chat box about how it links into those issues. So we'll go into some more detail on that tomorrow. Uh, so I hope you're all able to join. Um, 
if you have any other questions uh, in the meantime or things that we didn't touch on today that you um, would like to to talk about in more detail um, either in tomorrow's session or potentially in a further uh, webinar or online training session then please prepare your questions um, and either share them in the chat box um, I'll leave it open just after we close the discussion for you to add them here or um, share them by email afterwards and we can do our best to try and um, address those uh, in due course. So with that, um, thank you very much for all your interventions and I'll pass back to Faustina um, if there's anything else to, to mention before we close. Thanks. Thank you, Arabella. Uh, so I'd like to close by saying thank you to the presenters for facilitating a very productive discussion and to the countries for your active participation. Uh, we look forward to your participation in session two as well. Uh, thank you to Bonnie and Nagaya from Pro for being patient observers and we look forward to hearing from you tomorrow. I, before we close, uh, I'd also like to request Dr. Rashid, the regional advisor for uh, Wash and Climate Change in Sierra to give uh, his closing remarks. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Faustina. I think uh, we uh, already is take, we have already taken uh, a lot more time than we have planned. But I just would like to thank uh, Maggie, Carlos, Selena, Anjana, and all for the presentations made and the contributions made for this session. And thank you all the participants for the time and contributions, uh, Faustina and Arabella for moderating and organizing the uh, proceedings of the webinar. Uh, as Faustina mentioned, we would have hoped to see you all in Dhaka, but uh, uh, we don't. Well, we hope to see you all soon uh, once everything is okay. Uh, we should continue the momentum, and that's why we conducted this webinar. And we started the day, as uh, we all know, from, uh, with the presentation from Carlos and Elena on covering the framework on building climate resilient and environmentally sustainable healthcare facilities, uh, background pathways and environmental conditions, social conditions and the exposures, early warning systems and impacts on health, covering assessment tool and ongoing activities and priorities at country level by Elena was very useful. Uh, we then had the presentation from Maggie, Global Work on Washing Healthcare Facilities, Initiatives and Highlights that are Integrated and Mainstreamed, Quality of Care, Wash and IPC Links and Dimensions, also covering AMR Links. She also gave an overview on Global Wash Targets and Timelines. The pre practical steps were indeed very useful. And the presentation from Anjana, uh, Ensuring Cleaner, Safe, health facilities, quality and safety to achieve universal health coverage, highlighting the regional patient safety strategy pillars, and importantly, the fit for service dashboard and uh, washing healthcare facilities and IPC as well. And finally, we heard from country highlights covering the situation and challenges. We heard from the participants about the good practices and indeed the challenges. Uh, this is very useful and certainly will guide us in formulating ways to help the member states technically in the coming days. We look forward to meeting on tomorrow to cover the remaining session covering WashFit, which will be online training and which will be very useful for all the participants. And thank you very much once again for everyone for conducting this and we look forward to see you on tomorrow. Thank you for staying. Thank you everyone. So I think we are uh, done for the day and see you tomorrow. Bye. Goodbye.